ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to greet you again at our online proceedings of Kharkiv International Security Forum. It's the third year of our forum and of our fruitful cooperation with Conrad Adenauer Steve from Kharkiv office. I hope that someday we will meet again in person in Kharkiv. It's a great sunny weather in Kharkiv right now. And I'm happy to give the floor to Dr. Brigitte Tribel, the head of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung Kharkiv office. Please, Brigitte. Szanowni Pani i Panowie, witaju. It's a pleasure for me to open this discussion event on the cooperation between Ukraine and NATO. My name is Brigitte Triebe and I'm the head of the German Konrad Adenauer Foundation here in Haki. We regard our foundation as independent, but we share the values and the goals of the Christian Democratic Union, the party of the German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Thus, one of the main topics we work on is security. In an international context, context, that means we support Germany's partner countries, such as Ukraine, in their security challenges. During these last weeks, we have seen once more how crucial Ukraine's security situation is. Today, we will discuss two of the current key questions. What kind of support does Ukraine need from NATO in the conflict with Russia? And what kind of support are the partners willing to give? Besides, we are not the only ones talking about the topic today. NATO is also debating on the escalation of the conflict right now. I'm glad that we continue our cooperation with Maidan Monitoring during this event, which is a part of the International Security Forum Fights for Minds in the time of hybrid wars. I would like to thank Valery Kravchenko, Janusz Onichkiewicz, Mantas Matsikas, and Plant Grant very much for joining our event and discussing on this topic. Thanks to Andri Karakuts for the moderation. Thank you, Brigitte. And I'm Natalia Zubara, head of Maidan Monitoring Information Center. Our uh, organization, civil organization, is focused on uh, security. And we consider that accession of Ukraine into NATO and NATO standards implemented in Ukraine as a crucial part of uh, security in Ukraine. However, we are also, uh, and it is one of our NGO objectives to, uh, for Ukraine to be a part of NATO. However, we see we are very much a, like a realistic organization and we are like a skeptics. So what we actually see, I will just highlight the problems which I personally hope will be somehow addressed uh, during the today's discussion. Our government, Ukrainian government, speaks a lot about NATO accession, but does, well, I cannot say that they do a lot. And that is a question what we can do to help them or to motivate them to really implement the NATO standards. Uh, the second problem is that most Ukrainian citizens, in our opinion, in my opinion, held absolutely unrealistic um, visions of the NATO, ranging from demonic to magical. And it's not okay as well. And the third and uh, very uh, important uh, issue for the international perspective that the most citizens, in, in my opinion, I may be wrong and you will correct me, most citizens of the NATO member countries have no idea why uh, their uh, membership of Ukraine or how the membership of Ukraine and NATO can boost their security. So my, uh, my question or my concerns is how can we actually address these issues? If you support me in my idea that these are very uh, serious uh, issues. 
So uh, we are continuing to build the community around the forum, and I am happy to greet the moderator of this today's event, uh, Andrew Kar Andrei Karakuts, who is the head of the Center for Applied Research. Please, your floor, and Andrei. Uh, thank you, Natalia. Uh, I want to uh, also uh, uh, to thank, uh, first of all, organizers uh, of this event, uh, Maidan Monitoring Information Center and uh, Konrad Adenau Stiftung. Uh, and I want to welcome all participants uh, to this online discussion, cooperation with NATO as a state security enhancer in frames of Kharkiv International Security Forum. Uh, this seminar has a very important topic, uh, uh, Ukraine's uh, Euro-Atlantic integration and more broad, uh, events uh, around uh, Ukraine, security uh, situation, Ru Russian military buildup. Uh, and today uh, we have a team of uh, renowned experts uh, and uh, I want to introduce them in the order of appearance. Uh, Valery Kravchenko, uh, he is expert at the National Institute for Strategic Studies, Ukraine. Uh, Glenn Grant, a hard nosed reform expert working at Ukrainian Institute for the Future and UK Institute for Statecraft. Janusz Oleczkiewicz, uh, former Vice President of the European Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee, Poland. Mantas Masikas, uh, Director of the Memel Institute Policy Analyst, PhD students at Vitautas Magnus University, Lithuania. Uh, we will have a very dynamic timetable. Uh, we have three topics, uh, and each expert will have from five to eight minutes to comment each of these topics. And I kindly ask speakers yeah, to stick to this um, timetable. Um, uh, then, uh, after we will cover all three topics, I will open floor for general discussion, uh, Q&A session, and I want to ask participants uh, to write their questions in the Q&A uh, chat uh, or uh, uh, general chat. Uh, so the last 30 minutes will be devoted to uh, answers from our speakers. Uh, discussion is broadcast live on Facebook page of Conrad Adenauer Stiftung, uh, and later uh, I, I know that uh, it will be also posted on YouTube uh, channel of Maidan Monitoring Information Center. Uh, so now I'm pleased uh, uh, to give the floor uh, to first speaker, and this is first block uh, named Seven Years of Russian Aggression, Developments in Ukraine and Both Bites. So Valery, uh, floor is yours. Uh, you can start. Thank you, Andrei. Uh, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here and to introduce uh, some my notes, personal understanding of what is going on. Um, I would like to um, start with a trigger, actually. So, of course, we will sp speak about the NATO, but probably later, and uh, we will start our discussion from what is going on now. And uh, um, what is the trigger for that situation? It's a Russian. Uh, aggression, ongoing aggression, and the Russian very militaristic behavior, which we are um, seeing uh, near Ukrainian borders, and uh, it's um, the issue of great disturb. Uh, so, uh, the most important question in in that conditions is, um, what is it? Uh, is it a real threat? Is it a real military threat to Ukraine? And is it is it as uh, as we are talking, uh, the very vital threat for Ukraine. So, uh, and uh, or it's just a war scare. So it's a tactics to to get something in on the diplomatic front. Um, what we have to do now and uh, to understand that uh, they can, and that is a real threat, uh, and. Uh, they have a unique paradigm now and unique chance, actually, um, now or never. Um, what we are looking now in Europe is a global pandemic, the second year of global pandemic, and it's a unique uh, small screen to do something, to do something uh, in favor of uh, uh, Russian regime and um, the scared Russian population, actually. Uh, scared by the propaganda, by the ultimate propaganda of uh, Ukrainian as a Nazi country, and uh, you could easily uh, saw it uh, during the TV shows, uh, Russian TV shows, 
Uh, also, there are a few another noises, let's say, the elsewhere. So it's starting from the um, situation in, in uh, the Asia with the China, with the Arctic, uh, with the Libya, with the Syria, with the Africa. So uh, it's a good option uh, how to uh, make this small screen uh, even more efficient. Uh, so, if you're talking about the European uh, agenda, so it's uh, the time of elections, actually, in Germany uh, this year, in France next year. So, it's uh, uh, also about uh, you having your own troubles and uh, Ukraine have to, to decide uh, its troubles uh, uh, in direct dialogue with, the, with, the, with the Russia. Uh, also, um, we could say about the um, opportunity, and uh, the Russia is talking uh, very honestly about the peace enforcement of Ukraine. Uh, what they mean about the peace enforcement, I don't know, because uh, actually Ukraine is a very uh, peaceful country, let's say. Uh, but uh, still, um, I believe that uh, the, re uh, the regime of Putin is under the threat. Because if Ukraine will have a success story with Zelensky, with a populistic president, so it's the biggest threat and the sentence for Putin. And he clearly understands that story. Um, talking about the timelines um, of that aggression, we have to remember that uh, it was planned the Zapad 2021 and the military training, so not to the autumn. So uh, it's only probably the beginning of, of that uh, big stop for for region, uh, which we are uh, seeing now. Uh, and obviously, we are not ready for that big stop. I, when I saw the saying we, I mean Ukraine, Ukrainian society, with a peaceful uh, paradigm, uh, with a weak, uh, actually weak armed forces, much uh, better than it was uh, seven years ago, but still Soviet, or let's say post-Soviet. Uh, with an active fifth column uh, of uh, agents, of Russian agents uh, in our country, uh, headed by the Viktor Medvedchuk and uh, other politicians sitting in the Verkhovna Rada. Uh, with still strong understanding of the democratic values uh, associated with the chaos and uh, even with the corruption. Uh, and uh, in, in the same time, uh, authoritarian regime uh, is uh, nostalgic with order and uh, Putin uh, using these uh, options. Uh, now we are talking about the diplomatic way. Uh, of course, you know about this uh, phone uh, talk uh, yesterday between Biden and uh, uh, Putin, and it's another high hopes for diplomacy, but high hopes um, could be helpful as soon as uh, there is a space for uh, some kind of mutual compromises. Um, Unfortunately, Russia has given uh, the ultimatum uh, and will give the ultimatum, I believe, towards uh, the situation in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, of, of course, for the United States, this, this, uh, the ultimatum will be uh, unacceptable. Um, and uh, uh, one of the issues of that ultimatum is about the NATO, about the future uh, uh, perspective for our country to decide uh, where we have to be uh, in what space we have to be. If uh, um, US approach will be delivered, so it's about the democratic choice of Ukraine, uh, what side to go. And if uh, on that uh, negotiations, the Putin's approach will be uh, uh, more popular, let's say, so it's about the spheres of influence and it's about the preserving the buffet here. I believe that uh, so mm, different approaches uh, could not be compromised. So um, resuming uh, what we are uh, having now, so now, now we are going to the diplomatic deadlock uh, and probably only escalation factor um, could change that the status quo which having now. And of course, the Russian Federation is very interesting in, in, in that escalation. So uh, while we are looking for diplomacy, uh, we have to um, understand and, and uh, uh, to, to go with uh, the uh, very simple uh, paradigm. So um, in Joe Biden in the United States, we trust, but keep our gunpowder dry. Thank you.
thank you, Valery. Uh, and now I want to give floor to our next speaker, uh, Mr. Glenn Grant. Uh, as we know, he is now in Riga, Latvia. So, Glenn, floor is yours. The micro is off. Being silly again. Um, just at the start, I'd just like to say that I've actually moved on from the Institute from the Future. Uh, and I'm now actually doing business work in uh, in Kiev um, on the simple grounds that actually the work, that just doing an analytical work and, uh, and trying to support the Ministry of Defence was frankly um, a waste of time uh, because nobody was actually doing anything with any of the ideas and we can see the result today. Um, but that's a pity and hopefully it will change as people understand that uh, to move to work with NATO uh, and to move towards NATO actually does mean working with NATO with being the big word because that with is not something that actually um, people understand uh, very well in in Ukraine with means being friends that means that when you go to the Ministry of Defense you don't wait outside for for two hours it means someone picks you up immediately and takes you in with joy and pleasure that you are there. Uh, that, that people don't uh, make the, uh, uh, the which colour toilet paper you have secret. Uh, that you don't get escorted to the toilet by a colonel. Um, and uh, which, of course, we still do here. That, that people actually want you to be there. And at the moment, this is the, this is the, the fundamental major problem that, that Ukraine has is that, that people still see NATO uh, as, I don't know, the enemy almost in some ways. You know, that, 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 that they don't understand that people are there from NATO to actually to be there to help you, to work with you, to do things. And if I could run through a few of the things that, that, um, that you might say, what kind of support does NATO, uh, Ukraine need from NATO? Well, one of the things is to understand the political level, the political view. Uh, that's probably the most important in, my, in my, my mind. And that's, you know, how do you deliver strategy? How do you deliver uh, direction to the, uh, to, 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 the, to the armed forces? How do you actually think about this as a politician? What do we want from our armed forces? And that, that means moving on from the day-to-day -day management of the president's administration um, to some long-term thinking, some long-term direction of, you know, you must be able to do this. You must be able to do that. And in most countries, this is done by the, first of all, that work is done by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, not, not anybody else. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs do this. And then that is agreed by government and then that work then goes politically as a direction uh, towards the Ministry of Defence. And then the Ministry of Defence and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs collectively produce the how are we going to do this uh, as a white paper. Um, and these, these top level stages are completely missing in Ukraine. Um, and we get a direction, but the direction is the, um, uh, to describe what my friend Tom Young calls it, the world is a terribly difficult place. Well, we know that. Um, we all know it's a terribly difficult place. We know what China's doing. We know what Russia's doing. But what is really important and that, 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 that NATO countries do is we then say, well, so what? What does that mean? If the world is difficult, what must we be able to do to counter that? And that's got to be linked to money. And this is something that NATO countries try to get right. They don't all get it right. I can, I can direct you towards countries like Bulgaria that, that are failing badly in getting it right. But, but, you know, the Netherlands, Belgium, Great Britain, America, Canada, they try hard to get the money and the direction into some sort of coherent balance, uh, which is quite important. So that's the first bit, the political, the political part. The second part, of course, that, that NATO demands is that, that civilian oversight of the military. And this is really important, that parliamentary oversight. Remember that in Ukraine, the president is not a civilian. The president is the chief military person. He does not provide civilian oversight. Otherwise, he will be judging himself. 
And so he, he is the chief soldier, you could say. And so the, the, having parliamentary oversight over the, uh, over the military is a NATO must. And at the moment, there is absolutely no civilian oversight over the military in Ukraine at all. Not, 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 not a shred. Zero. Uh, when the present minister came in, he removed the, the, the project office which was doing a good job of some civilian oversight. And there was also a civilian council, and he removed that. So governance. Um, and then I think the third bit is the, is the methodological support for, the, um, for defence management. How do you actually manage inside defence? How do you go from being a, a Soviet Union defence management organisation bound by heavy rules, regulations and law to something that actually is uh, agile and quick. And I, uh, I, I give you one example um, from my own country, Great Britain, is that there is a thing called an urgent operational requirement law, which means that we don't have to go through all the processes when something is urgent for war, because war unfortunately demands things that you didn't think of, whether it's extra food, extra fuel, extra something or other, extra this or that. And you've got to be able to buy them immediately. Here we are in Ukraine still with the, uh, the, the, the defence order for 2021 unsigned. And here we are halfway through April. Um, and and the, 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 the new Procurement Act are unmanageable because nobody's changed the law. Now, NATO countries know how to deal with these things so that you can do things quickly. But you have to get that from NATO. You have to be wanting for NATO to help you write the law. You have to be wanting for NATO to, to, to do that. And, and I will finish by just saying that having attended almost all the security service reform uh, committee meetings in the last year and a half. So I've sat on nearly all of them. I've been sitting on these committee meetings now with, with the Defence and Security Committee for well at three years, I should think. There is no appetite amongst people to actually to take what it is that NATO has got to offer. No appetite at all. So that question, what kind of support does Ukraine need? Uh, well, I tell you, that support is there. But you have to want to take it. And on that note, I shall finish. Uh, thank you very much, Glenn, uh, that you stick to the timetable. Uh, now I want to give floor to Janusz Anishkevich, uh, uh, former Vice President of European Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee. Janusz, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I understand that in the first panel we are discussing about, about Russia-NATO relations and also about the, the threats from Russia. I would say that obviously NATO has a lot of things to discuss with Russia. There, will, there are problems like open, open skies treaty, like INF, like tactical nuclear weapons. The problem, however, is that NATO discussing with Russia these issues, which are absolutely necessary to, to, to discuss, uh, should remember all the time about Ukraine. And Ukraine somehow should be involved in this discussion. Let me give you just one example. And the problem with tactical nuclear weapons is that Russia somehow develops a concept of so-called de-escalation, which means that Russia uh, the, when we sort of facing a situation of, of a defeat, may use tactical nuclear weapons uh, to stop the, 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 the possible possible defeat uh, and initiate a discussion on some kind of a ceasefire on Russian terms. There are problems how Russia will use the nuclear weapons. Uh, what is the meaning? Of, of, of their of their military doctrine and so on and so on. So there are many things NATO should discuss with Russia and probably will discuss with Russia of tactical nature because the whole 
architecture which we developed uh, in last say 30 40 years uh, is now being uh, sort of un under 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 tremendous threat that whole ar architecture of, of whole security institutions and procedures uh, when we talk about uh, the threats from russia well it is rather difficult to say what russia really wants to achieve it is very unlikely that Russia really is considering sort of an all-out attack. Maybe Russia is just flexing its muscles. I don't know. It is it is quite quite an enigma. Uh, we should really uh, wait and see. And what is quite important uh, is that there are signals, very strong signals coming from all sides supporting Ukraine and showing that the Ukrainian matter it is a matter of the whole international community. Let me remind you, you know, the position taken by by United States, by by NATO, and also by Turkey, uh, which obviously should be sort of, quite of a factor taken uh, by by Russia. But coming back to to Ukraine and to the situation with Ukraine, which uh, recently was mentioned by, uh, by Mr. Grant. I would also add one another element to this list of, I would say, expectations or requests. Uh, well, I am afraid that in Ukraine, uh, making commitments uh, is something which uh, is not very often followed by delivery. And this is the trouble that Ukraine sometimes is quite ready to declare something and then nothing happens. Uh, so this is something which was very common during the communist period and which was seen in the whole situation with with uh, community with with, with with in relations with Russia, when there were many kind of treaties and 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 nothing was happening. So I think that Ukraine should increase its credibility. Uh, not promising too much, uh, but promising what Ukraine can deliver and what Ukraine will deliver. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for your uh, comment. Uh, and now we are moving to our last uh, speaker, uh, Mantas Masikas. Mantas. Thank you, Andrew. So talking about Russia and NATO relationship, nothing has really changed in those years. And it's uh, probably hardly to imagine that something will change in the nearest future. Uh, Russia remains the chief adversary of NATO, but the military bloc uh, is also aware of the China challenge, as it was mentioned in, the, in, the, in this panel. We still can say that all the challenges are the same and the relationship with Russia is complicated, which I would describe by going from stable negative to very negative. While the NATO-Russia relationship was formally launched in 1997, the need for cooperation between these two entities was discussed even before the final dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. In one of his uh, first foreign policy statements, uh, Russian President Yeltsin pledged uh, Russia's participation in North Atlantic Cooperation Council. He also even suggested that Russia might someday become a NATO member. Well, everything has changed radically. Russia now is the chief challenge for NATO, especially in eastern borders, military and politically. Uh, Kremlin officials sought confrontation with the West while pursing their strategy on various levels. Poland and the Baltics, uh, where I'm from, is most interested in what is taking place across Central and Eastern Europe. This encompasses the Russian military invasion in, of Ukraine, the emergence of frozen conflicts, disinformation, and economic pressure. Uh, also, what we see is that Moscow is back to playing brinkmanship in Ukraine. Over the past weeks, it has built up military forces in, in northern Crimea and along Ukraine's eastern border. Uh, Russian officials and senior uh, media figures have spread some accusations that uh, Kyiv is preparing a military offensive and shelling civilians in occupied eastern Ukraine. All of this could be preparation for a new Kremlin's offensive. Uh, so the aim might be to seize Mariupol or the canal of Kherson Oblast taking water from Dnipro River or to Crimea, or Russia may seek to introduce peacekeepers so-called into so-called Luhansk and Donetsk People Republics. 
Alternatively, it might simply be an effort to force concessions from President Zelensky and to test United States President Biden. If that is the case, Biden uh, probably has passed the test. And Washington uh, bombarded the Kiev with telephone calls uh, in the past few weeks with calls coming from Biden himself. Also, NCC advisor Sullivan, uh, Secretary Blinken, uh, Secretary of Defense Austin, and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs uh, Staff Miley all were offer offering uh, support for Ukraine to ensure that Kremlin got the message. Uh, Biden and Miley also called Moscow. So all of uh, this reduces the odds that Moscow will strike, but uh, the feckless response from Berlin and Paris calling on both Russia and Ukraine to avoid uh, provocative steps uh, does the opposite, I would say. Uh, it is now the time for Washington to provide additional leadership by announcing conditional sanctions that would uh, be lived on uh, Russia if it escalates in Ukraine. So the sanctions could be placed on Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And here is the positive message uh, to Ukraine, uh, Poland, uh, Baltic states and other countries that sees Nord Stream 2 as a geopolitical tool to clash and divide Europe. Uh, the construction of Nord Stream 2 has been delayed for more than a year and completion is inc increasingly at risk after the United States imposed uh, sanctions on involved companies and threatened further steps. Uh, the pipeline uh, under the Baltic uh, Sea has been uh, the subject of heated debate for years. The project uh, would allow additional Russian gas to flow directly to Germany. Proponents argue that the pipeline is a commercial investment that is the key to Europe's supply security, while opponents and geopolitical experts, um, myself, uh, I criticize Nord Stream 2 on environmental, geopolitical, and security grounds. Secretary Blinken uh, calls on involved companies to immediately abandon work on the pipeline. And uh, the Biden administration in the mid-March uh, made clear it is committed to complying with the sanctions legislation put in place with the bipartisan support in Congress and called on companies involved to immediately um, abandon work on the pipeline. So this damped, uh, dampened the expectations for a deal between Germany and the United States which arose when the Biden administration did not sanction new entities involved in the project in late February. Talking about uh, the military threats, it is uh, impossible to predict every potential crisis that might arise between Russia and NATO member states. Uh, Kremlin has carried out surprise actions on NATO territory in recent years that no one could reasonably have foreseen uh, ranging from uh, kidnapping an Estonian security officer or to hacking United States DNC emails. The scenarios that follow, though far from exhaustive, uh, are ones that Western experts have thought about deeply with the grave concern and are credible threats that Russian aggression may pose to NATO security. So a crisis might escalate after an encounter between NATO and Russian military vehicles in peacetime, uh, Russian military aircraft and naval vessels have approached to, or breached NATO sovereign borders dozens of times since 2014 and have provoked more dangerous incidents in international waters and airspace by coming too close at too high speed to their United States and NATO counterparts. Well, not all of these incidents are publicly announced, so the true number may be much higher and any of these incidents could get out hand and provoke a lethal response. So that would be for me now. Uh, thank you very much for all speakers. Uh, uh, we will, I think we will return to this topic uh, after uh, the whole uh, blocks are covered uh, because yes, uh, the situation uh, around Ukraine and the Russian aggression, possible Russian aggression is, uh, uh, is uh, now discussed, uh, I think, uh, in every country, uh, European country. Uh, uh, so now we are moving to block uh, two. Um, uh, it, uh, the name of it, uh, threats of non-conventional nature. And uh, uh, in this block, uh, we need to understand uh, how uh, new security threats uh, are 
viewed uh, in NATO countries and Ukraine, uh, especially uh, how Article 5 covers uh, these unconventional attacks. Uh, so uh, we are moving in the uh, same uh, order, uh, and I want to give floor to Valerie. Thank you, Andrei. Uh, first of all, we have to understand that uh, all threats uh, we'll face in future will be of a mixed nature. So we could not uh, deliver with the conventional or non-conventional threats. So uh, now uh, it's the, our joint reality. Uh, and um, the wage of, of, of such non-conventional threats will be bigger and the scales of that conventional threats also will, will, uh, will uh, be bigger. Um, if you uh, speak about the uh, NATO approach, how to change, uh, uh, let's say, its uh, concept, or, uh, and uh, that's what is, um, was put to the report and uh, NATO reflection process, uh, the new era for, for, for NATO, and new solidarity, let's say. Uh, uh, and uh, there are as four um, receipts uh, how to how to how to use uh, and how to react on on that uh, nature uh, the first one is uh, about the new role let's say of secretary general uh, now it's uh, the political position uh, in the alliance and uh, if you're talking about the necessity to react in in a very brief uh, frames uh, so the the um, position of uh, NATO Secretary General is uh, of ultimate uh, importance. Uh, the second uh, one is uh, about the, mm, the basis of the NATO, the consensus uh, uh, issue. Uh, and of course, if you are having the 30 countries which very different uh, interests, it's very tough to issue to, to, to find the consensus uh, in, in, in the, uh, some uh, timelines uh, which are quite limited. So. Uh, consensus uh, will be uh, uh, preserved for sure. Uh, uh, it's uh, the uh, origin of quality of, of another member states. But uh, uh, in the conditions of when you will need to react in 24 hours, let's say, uh, I believe that uh, um, the coalitions uh, inside the alliance have to be uh, organized. And uh, in that conditions, the, the competitive advantage of uh, such platforms as Bucharest 9, for example, of the, the countries which are uh, allocated in the eastern flank of Alliance and uh, clearly understands what is Russia and what is the Russian threat uh, and uh, the nature of the revanchism and revisionism of Russia and the tools they could use. So uh, that understanding is uh, clearly important. Uh, so uh, the competitive advantage of, 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 of that uh, uh, flank is the existence of such two as Bucharest 9. Um, finishing uh, uh, talking about the unconventional threats, uh, I, I could say um, it, it's linked with my previous probably speech about some unconventional spoilers we are expecting uh, Russia could use now in Ukraine for some kind of provocations. Um, everyone is talking about the necessity of Glavitz incident for Russia to to move their force uh, forward, uh, and uh, um, in that uh, meaning, uh, we could speak about some um, uh, some uh, um, understanding of the role of uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Moscow uh, Patriarchate, so it's a branch of Russian Orthodox Church. And um, we could measure that the influence, and uh, we could see that uh, in the last years and the last few months, uh, they were very active. Uh, and uh, for this year, the um, Orthodox East uh, will be on the 2nd of May. And uh, if you are talking about the Odessa, it's a very special day for Odessa because um, seven years ago it was a tragedy in that city. Uh, and uh, Russia could use it uh, with a hybrid meaning. And also another conditions is about the 9th of May. It's a victory's day, it's a great celebration in Russia. 
It's one of the so-called Russian screpy. Uh, and uh, that day is one week after the Easter. So it's a day of memory uh, when uh, people will go to the cemeteries. So another very unique opportunity how to use this religious factor uh, and uh, in unconventional um, deal and uh, to, to, to organize kind of provocation in Ukraine. And uh, we could um, see and check what, what, what they can do, especially in Kharkiv, by the way, and especially in Odessa. Um, thank you. I will stop here. Uh, thank you, Bavari. Uh, Glenn, uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, it... <clears throat> this is this is this is quite interesting because I think that when, when you when you talk um, or listen to a lot of people who are talking about the unconventional side, they te there is a tendency for them to head towards the military uh, and cyber. Cyber is the easy one, isn't it? I mean, everybody jumps on cyber straight away um, uh, as though this is the unconventional threat that we're facing. But actually. That in my view, the unconventional threat we're, we're facing is the uh, undermining of politics, um, which we've seen in America, but 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 is actually happening all over Europe, all, all through NATO, which is this. Uh, I call it the the the, the, the um, uh, I call it the, the Gazprom problem of you know offering people a job in Gazprom when they leave politics, so that they tend to swing towards Russian views and ideas rather rather than anything else but of course if you, one looks at uk i mean there's been a re, there was a really heavy undermining of the political class with russian money in uk and and, and this is this has gone on everywhere and I, I see this as as the number one uh unconventional threat to to nato and to to to, to the western world is that is that russian money and the, and what it's doing and and because it really is, it really does, it changes things at the top level. Uh, and it means that, you know, your, the direction of looking and the direction of view changes uh, towards something that is benign, but not, not positive for Russia, but it's certainly benign, at least, on the Russian side. I think the second thing I would look at is also is the business and corruption uh, area, which is also very strong and very heavy in some countries. Uh, we saw it with um, with S four hundred to to Turkey. Uh, we saw it with uh, in Bulgaria with Bulgaria still with its aircraft maintenance for helicopters and aircraft. Uh, the the money going into Russia for maintenance of NATO aircraft, which is a bizarre situation, um, uh, and that's going on as we speak at the moment. Uh, and then, then of course, there, there is the, uh, the 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 strategic communications uh, challenge, which is we know is really really heavy, uh, and and heavier into some countries than others. I mean, it, Latvia. Just looking last week, uh, only last week, there's a major two-page article written from Moscow in the Russian-speaking press in Latvia. We're just basically saying, you know, Russia is great, uh, NATO is rubbish, and everybody's, you know, NATO's going to let you down when, when it becomes critical. And you think, well, how does anybody miss this? And then, of course, the answer is they're not looking. Um, you know, strategic communications means absolutely constant attention to the media day on day, because Russia is really day on day on day. It, it doesn't stop. It just keeps digging away at it. Uh, and then I think the last thing that I would say, which is which is not new, which is the sort of the spying and the undermining, undermining of defence from the inside, uh, which is a which is a real problem with NATO. I mean, we've seen it with 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 Estonia, Italy and, and more recently again with Bulgaria, with five people arrested for spying. And don't tell me if there are five in the defence system, there are only five. Uh, and and some countries are better at actually trying to dig this out than others. Uh, Estonia being one of the one of the better ones for really really trying to stop things. Um, but I mean, if it, if Italy is is producing people that are doing this, uh, and they're miles away from Russia, 
then you have to say that it's happening everywhere else as well and that, that countries have to be absolutely uh, on the ball watching to try and make sure that, that Ru because Russia is working to undermine defence from within everywhere all the time. And then you have to come up with this last bit is, come on, Ukraine, why is nobody being caught in, in Ukraine? Please don't tell me that there is nobody working for Russia inside the defence system, because it's obvious that there is, uh, but they're not catching them. They're not being caught. Uh, and I will finish on that note. Uh, thank you, Glenn. So, uh, uh, so uh, we are moving to Janusz. Thank you. I will start with a certain historical uh, remark. Well, in a long time ago, the Russian emigrant Messner wrote a book, Mutiny War. And he simply said that future war might be not just uh, waged using military means, but using totally different means. And this is now reflected in so-called Gerasimov doctrine. After all, according to Gerasimov, you win the war not by using military means. Military means are just the sort of the, the end of the process. You simply defeat your, your opponent by undermining the whole fabric of the society, the whole fabric of the state. Uh, you do that just inspiring some local problems, uh, instigating problems, uh, trying to, to work on building tensions between, I don't know, trade unions and, 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 and business, uh, between minorities uh, and, 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 and majority uh, in a population, and so on and so on, trying to also uh, develop conflicts between various political parties. In other words, simply undermining the state. And this actually was already done in the past. Let me remind you that, you know, during the First World War, Germany sent Lenin to Russia. And Lenin simply did what Germans <laughs> otherwise couldn't do it. He simply destroyed the state. And finally, Germany won the war on the, on, on the East, signing the Brest Litovsk uh, the, the, uh, agreement, uh, agreement which was so good for, for Russia, for, for Germany, the Germans would never dreamt of. So this is the problem. The problem is the cohesion and resilience of, of the state and, and sort of solid institutions, solid de de democracy and cohesion, internal cohesion of the state. And I think that this is the problem with Ukraine. This is problem everywhere, but this is the problem of Ukraine first. Because if Ukraine would be really a, a prosperous country, then you know the situation in Donetsk and Lugansk would look quite different. Uh, Ukraine can regain, you know, the control over these provinces by sort of proving that Ukraine is a is not a failed state. Uh, it's a state uh, with future uh, and, and 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 very very sort of. Uh, solid uh, and offering people uh, a good future, good future. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and we are moving to Mandov. So unconventional and hybrid tools are constantly evolving. Uh, so NATO countries and Ukraine naturally put itself into a situation where it has act. It is difficult to fight with false information on social media, cyber attacks against governments, and it is also a question how to manage Russian channel uh, SOFA disinformation campaign. The thing is that in general, democratic societies can't physically uh, block the spread of inform information, whether it is true or false, because it breaks the understanding of what we understand as a freedom of speech and a free choice. I understand the, that it sounds tricky when we have to fight with this information. So it's like a war, you know, it's like going to war without knowing how many and what our targets are. So this information is the biggest threat nowadays uh, during the pandemic because it slowly affects society, which for a long time does not even recognize that it is being affected. Therefore, the state only turns 
to its defense system the moment it becomes visible and uh, when perhaps damage has already been inflicted. For example, um, more than uh, 20 years, uh, the narrative that Crimea belongs to Russia was pursed by means of soft power. Therefore, when the little green man showed up, society in the peninsula did not resist the brutal violations of the most basic international norms in the 21st century. So Russia has implemented the most integrated system of uh, state-sponsored propaganda in the world uh, by using Sputnik uh, news or Russia Today. So the exact understanding of the Kremlin as to what the media is and what journalists are for has been well represented by Sergei Shoigu, the Russian Minister of Defense, who said the following, I will start the citation, the day has come when we all have to admit that a word, a camera, a photo, the internet, the information in general have become a yet another type of weapon, yet another component of the armed forces. This weapon can be used both in a good and in a bad way. This is a weapon that was involved in various events in our country in different years, both in our defeats and in our victories, the end of citation. So we can understand how Russia uses uh, information, how use propaganda in good and in bad ways, as, as, as uh, Sergei Shoigu said. So I would like to discuss a little bit more uh, about um, the historic narratives and Lithuanian example by pointing out one very accurate quote, who controls the past controls the future, who controls the present controls the past. This is George Orwell's famous quote, which comes from his justifiably famous science fiction novel, 1984. This quote is not just the reality of a fictional uh, totalitarian society. It is a phenomenon that exists in today's world. History speaks through past stories about who we are today and who we should be in the future. After the restoration of Lithuania's independence, there was no space in the narrative of Lithuanian history for the cult of the heroic Red Army and its glorious victory in the so-called Great Patriotic War. Today, the Lithuanian view of history of World War II recounts the role of the Soviets as being equal to that uh, of the Nazis. In other words, the Soviet Union is perceived as an aggressor which illegally occupied Lithuania while the people who opposed the Soviet occupation and were participants of the anti-Soviet resistance or underground nonviolent resistance uh, are treated as the new heroes of Lithuania. So this narrative of Lithuanian history contradicts the cult of the so-called Russian heroic victory in the World War II. And it's precisely for this reason that the Kremlin's historical policy towards uh, Lithuania and other countries has relied heavily on the attempt to pursue that the Soviet occupation was a voluntary step made by the Lithuanian government and its people. There is also a widespread questioning of the memory of the restoration of independence and other important dates uh, of Lithuanian states. Various media outlets are employed to downplay partisan activities, promote nostalgia for the Soviet past, criticize the aspirations to investigate Soviet crimes and improve the image of those who worked in the Soviet structures and those responsible for mass deportations. So I'm talking about the historic policy and the historic narratives. And I think, and I see uh, this is very important, you know, nowadays, one of the most frequent, uh, uh, frequent attack uh, episodes of Lithuanian history is the June uprising in uh, 1941. For uh, half a century, Soviet propaganda has been uh, relentlessly telling lies, despising the June 90, 90, uh, 1941 uprising, the commemoration of its participants and politically persecuted them. They could not have done otherwise because uh, they had to justify their occupation and its brutal domination. Otherwise, it would have been admi an admission that the Bolsheviks in Lithuania were only uninvited guests who had to hurry out from here as soon as they lost their armed backing of Moscow. And today again, we see brutal propaganda, books written blaming uh, Soviet resistance, beating of memorial boards in Vilnius, some false accusations and so on and so on. And also the books uh, are written, uh, funded by the, the Kremlin, uh, were published in, in Italy, in various countries in all over Europe. So 
we see that state propaganda really works and I think Ukraine should uh, be really resistant and pay attention to, to, to rewriting the history because as I mentioned, those who control the history controls uh, uh, the future, controls even the present. And it was the same about the tragedy in Lithuania on January 1991, uh, in January 13, 1991, near the TV tower in Vilnius in 2007, the Russian broadcaster First uh, Baltic Channel showed a TV program telling uh, the sordid story of the events of January 13 after repeated re reports of such slandering information in 2013 when the commemoration of freedom fighter of Lithuania was defamed, the channel was banned. So probably it was the same in Maidan. Uh, there were a lot of false accusations and, and, and a lot of propaganda on this. And the next question should be what can be improved on national and NATO level? So in seeking a recipe that would limit the impact of propaganda, it is first and foremost important to answer the question of whether we can equate and the impact of propaganda with uh, the spread of Russian media or Russian cultural production in Baltics and Ukraine. During the pandemic, I would say that uh, a very important task for NATO countries and alliance itself is to provide protection to the information field of its member states as it is now one of the major spheres of hybrid warfare. Uh, counteraction uh, to disinformation could be made by strengthening the understanding about the past and present through cooperation with leading news agencies, think tanks, and the establishment of special structures that would track uh, and assess the risks and threats in this area. Um, the preparation part is the most elaborate one. It includes in chance awareness, which means strategic ass assessments, especially focus on particular sensitive regions as the Black Sea, Baltic Sea, Arctic and North Atlantic. Also information environment assessments, which should be aimed to understand this information and the hostile narratives. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank all speakers for covering the second block. Uh, and in this uh, dynamic format, uh, format, I think we will need uh, two more. Uh, yeah, because uh, now we are moving to last block. Uh, future of Ukraine, uh, NATO cooperation. Uh, and uh, uh, in this block, uh, we will discuss challenges for Ukraine uh, uh, to join NATO. And uh, first of all, uh, this uh, challenge that uncontrolled and occupied territories of Ukraine are the obstacle for joining NATO. So, Valery, floor is. Thank you. So, I hope that uh, we have will have a very uh, good perspective with the NATO, uh, even not with a cooperation with NATO, but with integration with NATO. But it depends on a, a lot of factors. And uh, I suppose the Russia is not the last one of that factor, but still. Um, so uh, we could clearly understand what Russia is trying to do now. That's uh, very important to, to be sure uh, in uh, our response about, uh, about that uh, dealing. Um, what the Russia want to do with Ukraine is to make here the battlefield, the gray zone. I don't believe that the primary goal is still on the agenda, so about the sphere of influence. I hope and I believe that Ukraine will not be the sphere of influence of Russia. So they don't have enough agents and capacity inside my country, but uh, they still have uh, enough agents and capacity to destroy my country. So uh, that is the, the primary goal, uh, that's the, the um, try to make a strategic vacuum. So why we need a NATO? We need to overcome this vacuum. We need to ruin these plans uh, and um, of course, Russia is looking on Ukraine as a A2 AD zone. Uh, so it's something which uh, they could uh, make as a buffer. Um, as uh, we are talking about the Ukrainian position, we are very frequently proud with our civilization and choice with the Euro Euromaidan in 2014. But uh, actually, uh, we are proud and but still limited in understanding what is civilization choice. Uh, we, what the way we need to improve to, to, to be uh, in the circle of the European countries. 
so uh, that is the main recipe uh, in uh, the Ukraine NATO relations. So now we are talking about the map and the perspective of, the, of uh, receiving of the map. Uh, of course, the map is useful. The map is a strong signal. Uh, but even more important, it's real reforms, especially in the security and defense sector. Uh, still, we have um, something which we are ha having uh, uh, besides the map. It's ANP, annual national programs. It was uh, proposed in the Bucharest summit in uh, 2008 as uh, uh, something which we could uh, implement just now for Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, we have to be successful in that story. Uh, so we have another instrument also, it's the Europe Enhanced Opportunity Partnership. Uh, I still uh, think that it's the wrong way for Ukraine because it's about the partnership and we need an integration. But uh, if you are talking uh, honestly, it's a very useful tool. It's a very useful tool uh, from our military uh, cooperation. Uh, it's uh, creating the opportunities, uh, and uh, especially in sharing intelligence, for example, uh, education of the military staff, uh, more trainings, etc. So we have to use this tool. And uh, in June, it will be one year when we uh, when we join this initiative, and we have to show some kind of results. Uh, also, another sphere we have to enforce is um, solidarity inside the country and understanding of the people. What is the NATO? That NATO, it's about what Glenn Grant said just that it's not a threat. It's not, it's, uh, it's not something from the Soviet era and the Soviet propaganda. So NATO is um, very human and the main idea and the main, uh, let's say, value of a NATO is the human life. Uh, it's very uh, different for, from the Russian values, probably, and from post-Soviet, let's say. And uh, we need to speak with the population, especially in the eastern and the southern regions, with a very strict message boxes, uh, with a um, clear understanding in, in, on the Russian language also. So if people are perceiving the Russian language better than Ukrainian, okay. So it's not a political issue, and it is not... Uh, something which we have to politicize. Uh, politicize. Uh, and uh, regarding the position of Ukraine in the um, area, Black Sea area, so um, to be proactive, Ukraine, uh, unfortunately, sitting uh, uh, and waiting what will be proposed by NATO side. And it's uh, not the, the right position for our, our country. It's not time for games. So we have to share our views and to share our positions, especially with the closest neighbors and with the uh, uh, another uh, aspired countries with uh, Georgia, for example. Um, talking about the mutual benefit, uh, it was one of the points we need to speak. Mutual benefit is uh, in what Ukraine is not uh, uh, regarding uh, as a threat or challenge for NATO, but of course some countries uh, will say that joining of Ukraine that have an open military conflict with Russia is a threat. Uh, but still, it's not a threat, it's enhancing the capacity. It's uh, something which we are um, contributing to the security. It's illusion that we have uh, peace in Europe now. Uh, uh, and we have to understand clearly and to explain our position in, towards our allies. So uh, Ukrainian uh, army, probably not the best one, but it is uh, staying uh, on the first row uh, uh, deterring the aggression of Russian Federation, not against Ukraine, but against Europe, against the Western civilization. Uh, to be uh, clear, and uh, we have actually a formula how to move this road, uh, with this road. Uh, formula is very uh, understandable. Uh, NATO is the a lion uh, is, is, is a uh, um, NATO is the, the, let's say, the space of prosperity. This is a space of security and the space where all countries uh, are respecting each one and respecting the rules, the rule of law, what we need to do in Ukraine. Uh, it's another um, thing we need to do. It's a resilience inside of my country. 
and uh, also the strong political will without any uh, games under the table. And uh, of course, close friends we need, not allies, even, even friends, because we have to be uh, confident that we are not alone staying here uh, and uh, um, trying to, 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 to do our best with Russian aggression we are having in seven years in my country. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Valery. Uh, Glenn, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, uh, and I, that was a very impassioned, Valerie, and I, and I think I can understand uh, why the passion is there. Uh, I mean, this big question is is about NATO, is people not understanding it. And I think you, you raised that very, very clearly about understanding. And if, if I can just say, I don't think that Russia is the problem with the joining of NATO. Joining of NATO is a political thing. The, the problem is Ukraine. The problem is not Russia. Uh, and, and I think that the, the, as soon as Ukraine understands that the problem is, U, is Ukraine uh, and starts to actually to understand that part of it themselves, then things then, then the whole relationship with NATO will also will also change. I, I, I give you a couple of um, a couple of small stories. Um, I was defence attaché, British defence attaché in Estonia and and Latvia, uh, and and they're, they're NATO countries, and and they weren't NATO countries. Remember this: they were not NATO countries when I was a defence attaché. They became NATO countries, but before they were NATO countries, before I had a desk in the Estonian Ministry of Defence. I had a desk. I had a computer. I was on the computer network of the Estonian Ministry of Defence and I was a British defence attaché. I could go in, sit, work in the office with the International Relations Department and I had a second computer in the planning department in the Estonian Ministry of Defence before they were in NATO. So I went in and I worked with them regularly. And when I worked in, in Latvia, I didn't have a, an office in the in the defense ministry because um, my office in the in the uh, uh, my office in the in the embassy was only uh, about 110 meters from the Ministry of Defense. So actually, I could I didn't need it. But I had a pass and I used to go in and walk around and talk to everybody every day. Every day I was there, I walked around the ministry. I had free access free access to go and talk to the Chief of Defence. I didn't have to book to go and talk to the Chief of Defence. I just walked to his outer office and I just said, is the boss in? And if he was in, I stuck my head through the door and said, Admiral, everything OK? Oh, Glenn, come in, come in, come in. And we then talked. Now, this is important because this is what NATO is about. And then he'd say, I'm going to Britain in three weeks' time. Can you fix this? Can you fix that for me? And we do it. And we arrange as friendship. And the policy department in the Latvian Ministry of Defence used to go out every Friday evening for a drink. And I used to join them. And frequently the American defence attaché came out and we used to, and joined as well. And we sat and we talked policy with them about what people are doing. Now, that is being part of NATO. So... It's a it's a collective group of friends. And until people understand that 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 is like that, Ukraine will always have difficulty understanding this relationship. Um, there is a second bit which we talk about, which is the values and values is is a big part of NATO. And values have got to be open and they've got to be followed. Those values should determine the law. And this is on the annual national plan. AMP covers it. AMP covers values. AMP covers justice and law. AMP covers civil oversight. They're all there. So actually, the things that NATO wants for you to get closer to NATO as a country are actually fully exposed. But they're never discussed. Do you ever see any of this? Do you ever see anything from the annual national plan in the press? I don't. OK, but they should be. 
because they're national. It's annual national plan, not annual government plan, not annual defence ministry plan. It's an annual national plan because NATO is a national activity. And on that point, I will finish. Um, there are things that need to be done. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we are, have very passionate speeches now from Janusz uh, Lito. Fine. Well, I would not agree in, in, entirely that the problem of Ukraine is, is not Russia. That I think Russia is a problem. It's a problem in, in the situation when the, the treaty uh, should be uh, ratified with, with Ukraine. Uh, by parliaments, by US Senate. Uh, and I think that in the present situation, to be absolutely frank, I do not see you know, that that really would be realistic. Uh, it does not mean that we should not strive. I would be very much in favor of Ukraine joining NATO. But realistically, I do not think that this is really on the cards at, at the moment. So what could we expect and what could we do? Well, what I think could be done that is create a situation in which Ukraine, although not NATO member, could have a similar situation and relations with NATO like Sweden during the Cold War period. Uh, Sweden was theoretically a neutral country, but everybody knew exactly that in a situation of a major conflict, Sweden would not be sort of left aside and Sweden uh, actually based its defense planning on strict cooperation with NATO. So I think that that's what Ukraine should really try to do, to plan for, um, for some contingency, uh, you know, more or less together with NATO, not being a NATO member country. What NATO can offer, I think, is not an outright membership, but what NATO countries could offer and should offer Ukraine is a replica of Lend-Lease program, which US extended to United, to United Kingdom during the Second World War. What Lend-Lease program was, actually US provided, not being, not being a, 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 an allied country, uh, provided in the United Kingdom with all sorts of materials. And I think it, we need not to actually uh, go back to the Second World War period. It is enough to think and to look what U.S. did for Israel during in, in, in last in, in, in last years. Uh, there was when, when there was a Yom Kippur War, U.S. provided uh, Israel with sixty thousand tons of materials, fuel planes, uh, munition, and everything else. And I think that simply declaration that in a situation when there will be a major conflict between Ukraine and, uh, and Russia, when Russia would invade Ukraine, then the NATO countries would provide this sort of assistance, material assistance, not in terms of soldiers, but in terms of material support would be extremely important. The same, obviously, would be, uh, sh should in, in, in involve uh, exchange of information. I think that the placing, for example, AWACS planes and providing Ukraine with full information about the situation in the, in, in, in the battle area and in the whole thing would be of extremely importance. So I would say that this kind of a measure uh, is, 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 I would say, realistic. And I think that we should more or less follow this line. Uh, so again, I think that what really we should think in terms of how we can support Ukraine and how can, we can help Ukraine in realistic terms, there would be a, a replica of, of this nickel grass program United, of United States for Israel. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, before I give the floor to our uh, next speaker, uh, I want uh, to say to uh, people who are watching us on Facebook, you can write your questions in uh, comments. So I will uh, 
uh, then then I will, can ask uh, speakers uh, if you will write there. Uh, okay, uh, Mantas, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. History shows that political scientists are not the best sometimes on predicting the future, but let's try. So, uh, 12 years ago in Bucharest, uh, NATO promised that uh, Ukraine and Georgia will someday become NATO members. So well, today, the West needs uh, to do more to demonstrate that occupying Ukraine's territory does not give Russia a veto over these countries, uh, Euro-Atlantic aspirations. Uh, immediate moves could uh, include provision of additional defensive uh, military equipment, uh, such as naval vessels, air and coastal defense systems, drones, uh, establishment of a permanent uh, NATO training center in Ukraine and increased NATO maritime presence in the Balt uh, Black Sea and granting Ukraine major non-NATO ally status under U.S. law. Uh, NATO states uh, will soon uh, debate on a new strategic concept uh, with uh, its update outlined as one of the conclusions in the report prepared by the Reflection Group as uh, talks are scheduled to kick off in Brussels probably after a meeting in June 2021. Uh, most of the European countries uh, sees uh, its membership in NATO as a top pillar of national security in an unpredictable world full of uncertainty and emerging threats, keeping uh, the North Alliance, North Atlantic Alliance both efficient and coherent is in the vital interest of uh, Baltics and Poland, and, uh, and I hope uh, soon it will be in Ukraine. And uh, those countries understand the essence of uh, Ukraine, L Lithuania and other Baltic states understands it really as a vital uh, membership in NATO because of the common values. Uh, politically, it is of chief importance to maintain a robust uh, transatlantic link and a joint stance on Euro-Atlantic security with the uh, related challenges and threats. It is also vital for Baltic uh, Visegrad countries to tighten NATO's cooperation with Ukraine to increase stability right beyond NATO borders. Uh, militarily, it is essential to ensure credible means for NATO's uh, deterrence and defense also by promising a full, uh, efficient and rapid response to an armed invasion, regardless of where this took place and the number of enemy forces. Uh, thus, uh, NATO should place its defense planning process upon a realistic assessment of both threats and potential of its adversaries. On the eastern flank, this is Russia. Uh, the United States uh, has long been an opponent of the pipeline. I would like to point out the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which is a uh, kind of threat and, 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 and it blocks, you know, uh, the unity of the European Union. It blocks the unity of the NATO in some cases. And uh, as I mentioned, the United States was a, an opponent um, the administration of both presidents Barack Obama and Donald Trump have uh, clearly expressed their uh, opposition to the pipeline and the country introduced sanctions in December 2019 forcing pipeline vessels by Swiss company All Seas to stop working on the project and leading to a months long delay. Threats of more sanctions in the mid 2020 uh, now endangered the, the completion of the pipeline. So Finally, uh, many countries in Eastern Europe, uh, such as Poland, Slovakia, Ukraine, oppose Nord Stream 2, uh, partially because of expectations of a loss of transit fees and partially because of fears that their economic and physical security would be uh, jeopardized were the project to be completed. Uh, and also, uh, maybe it sounds uh, strange but also Europe should uh, you know lose uh, people like you know Schroeder because the Schroederization of Europe you know is also a big problem of Europe is also a big problem for for the unity and uh, the future uh, for countries like Ukraine in NATO because it clash and divides Europe it clash you know countries and my recommendation would be to deepen Ukraine integration with NATO, whether it can uh, be um, uh, grant Ukraine the status of major non-NATO ally under US law uh, and warn Russia that if it remains intransigent in Ukraine, Washington uh, will consider additional steps, including establishing a permanent US military 
presence at a Ukrainian training center close to the occupied territories and launching a NATO membership action plan uh, for Ukraine. And that would be all. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and uh, I want uh, uh, to thank all experts for their excellent speeches uh, during this uh, uh, block uh, discussion. Uh, and now we are moving to Q&A se session. Uh, now you are free uh, for uh, answering questions yeah, without any time frames. Um, and um, I see that there is um, your first question um, in the chat. Uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, yeah, how long the long-term Ukraine saying of NATO and uh, how can you evaluate present Ukraine situation this past? So um, how you estimate uh, 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 this cooperation yeah, in the long term. Uh, first step for perspective, and uh, uh, I propose uh, of you to have a free microphone, uh, and after another, another uh, expert's answer, you can raise a hand and I will uh, give uh, the floor to you. Uh, so, uh, who, who is ready to uh, answer this question? I will try to start. If you don't mind, uh, it's um, so Ukrainian to speak about the terms, <laughs> to be very strict uh, that tomorrow will be better than today. And um, if you are talking about the road to NATO, we have to understand that we started this road uh, uh, in uh, 1994 with uh, uh, the some uh, initiatives uh, uh, in frames of NATO and uh, then continued uh, with a charter in Madrid in 1997. So it, it's really a, a long term um, challenge for Ukraine. And uh, um, as for now, as I see, if, um, the prospect of uh, uh, receiving of MAP in, on the June summit. Uh, uh, it depends probably on uh, some environment we will have here and uh, some signals, very clear signals about the reformation of country uh, that we are uh, really implementing in Ukraine. But uh, if we will receive this map uh, that year, I, I'm skeptic about this. So I'm uh, thinking that it's perspective of probably the, the next summit uh, of an alliance, if status quo will be not ruined by Russia, of course, if, 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 if uh, not very bad scenario will uh, occur. Uh, so two years for receiving a map to um, making our home task. Uh, and uh, then uh, I hope it will be uh, up to four years uh, to, to, to uh, make another home task within the map and to to be the full scale uh, the member of NATO. So uh, if uh, we'll go about the, some very concrete period of, of time, so it's uh, up to six years we still need. But uh, it's unpredictable because of unpredictable environment we are having now. So and about because of political will uh, inside my country and outside, uh, I, I mean uh, the political will of the 30 uh, member states of uh, an alliance. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Valery. Um, yes, Glenn. Uh, I mean, go, g g looking looking historically, then Estonia, Latvia, and uh, Montenegro um, each took about three years once they got the map. Uh, it's about a three-year process, and 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 the the, the map is not a um, the map is not a, a sort of a one-off thing. It's it's a, it's something that you actually develop, uh, and and as you do the map, I mean it it is a map, and it's a map that you have to follow, uh, and so when you do the first year, you you actually have to show the changes. It's not it is not sufficient to actually just to write in the map and. Um, uh, and nothing happens. So, for example, in Montenegro, they had to show that they, they changed the structure. 
um, and the the, um, the the units in Montenegro were all lots of little companies and and bits and bobs that companies that they called battalions and uh, uh, and platoons that they called companies and and the, the, they had to actually to bring them all together to create one battalion to actually to show that they could do, have a battalion that could deploy with and for NATO um, and that was that was all laid out in the map by them but that the, the the thing was they actually had to do it and people came to look and to discuss what they were doing and i was there during the three years that montenegro was working and doing this so the map actually is not just something that sits in the ministry of defense uh, 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 and and someone writes a paper and sends it back to to nato um, the map actually demands change it demands change towards certain ways of working that are common with everybody else. Um, so, for example, I mean, in Ukraine at the moment, um, when uh, when the uh, battalions go to Yavri training area, uh, then they, you need about three infantry battalions to make a battalion, a NATO sized battalion to go to Yavri. Well, the, the map is going to demand that battalions in in Ukraine are NATO sized. And they are that the, it's not a company called a battalion. It's actually 500 men uh, uh, and ready. And those are the sorts of things, practical changes that the map will demand uh, there. It will demand things on environment. It will demand things on, on how your your systems work. So I, I would only say that, you know, yes, getting the map is something, but that the map is just the start. If you don't actually make the changes that the map wants or that the annual national plan asks you to make towards being NATO compatible, then uh, you can go on forever <laughs> because you won't, you know, you'll get the next year and it will have the same things as last year. It won't be a developed map where next year is a different level of challenges from last year. It'll just be the same one going back again and you will go no further forward. So it demands change. That's the big thing. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Mr. Grant, uh, for you, uh, it's another question is about uh, attitudes of Ukrainians towards NATO, uh, how, how to change them, uh, how to raise popularity of NATO. Uh, and uh, uh, the question is, uh, has a follow up that uh, finally this uh, uh, attitudes will also uh, uh, influence uh, polit political system, yeah? political elected, uh, political elected people. OK, well, I think that the uh, I mean, the, fir the first thing is that the, the country has actually got to, to to take this seriously. I mean, we have a NATO communications office. Um, uh, it's not their job to be talking about NATO. You should not have a NATO communications office. You should not need a NATO communications office if in your as it is in the um, uh, as it is in the constitution that you want to join NATO, then it's your job. It's a it's a, a Ukraine job to do NATO communications and to actually to test how the uh, how the country views NATO and to, to produce if you want to join NATO to produce positive NATO messages. Uh, and, and, and that's a, that's the first step to actually to make sure that people understand it, that schools understand it, that children understand it, that, that grandmas understand what is NATO. Uh, and that means politicians actually talking about it um, positively. And I can look back at Estonia uh, and, and Latvia uh, and hearing the politicians actually going on television and talking about why is it important we join NATO? What is the value? So that's a, that is the, the, the big the big thing. It's it's a, a national job to do this. If you want to join the club, you have to explain to people why the club has got value. Yourself. Uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for this advice. Uh, and uh, uh, other speakers uh, want to comment uh, this question, first question or not? Uh, okay, uh, uh, so we are moving to other question that was uh, posed. Uh, um, this question is, in the case of Russian uh, aggression, uh, military aggression, uh, what NATO uh, will be able to do, uh, uh, what Ukraine can expect, what support, what kind of uh, uh, 
maybe military uh, support. Uh, and we remember the situation of 2014, yes, then uh, when we expected uh, some support uh, and uh, uh, what uh, has changed in these seven years uh, and in the case of uh, this attack, Russian attack, uh, what we can expect. And it's especially interesting to uh, hear answers from our uh, uh, friends, yeah, from uh, Polish, Lithuanian and British. Thank you. Janusz? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I tried to indicate what NATO could do uh, realistically. Uh, and I will repeat, uh, first of all, uh, NATO should somehow uh, start some kind of serious talks with uh, the Ukrainian general staff and government uh, on what kind of assistance NATO countries should actually provide. It won't be easy because there could be in NATO differences of opinion that these stocks may somehow complicate the relations with Russia, can provoke Russia and so on. Uh, well, that could be handled, I hope, within NATO. But nevertheless, uh, I think that these talks clearly will not have sort of a very high profile. They should be, you know, very sort of, very sort of, I would say, even secret talks. But what could be formally done and openly done is, as I said, the, a declaration that in a situation when there will be a serious threat to Ukraine, that NATO countries uh, every country could somehow be involved in this pro in this program uh, would provide Ukraine with all sorts of material assistance, and not only material assistance, <inaudible> which I which I already mentioned, but also in 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 terms of intelligence, in terms of communication, and also in terms of I would say sanctions uh, against Russia. Well, one sanction which could be really kind of a nuclear weapon is attack on, on the Russian banking system. Uh, I don't want to go on, uh, you know, with, with, with details, but that really could be done. Uh, so to, to simply present Russia with really very, very serious alternatives, very serious scenarios in a situation that Russia will really do something serious against Ukraine uh, could be could have sort of a mitigating effect on Russia and hopefully will result in this in a situation when Russia may, may, may sort of rattle the sabre, but never will really use it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, who who want to answer next? Um, yes, I mean I, I think that that one one has to remember first of all that nato is already working extremely hard with ukraine um that this is not sort of you know russia will attack and nato will suddenly start to do something nato is already doing lots um uh, there, there is the uh, what, what's called the quint which is the the i'm going to say the big six which in fact historically has always been the big five uh, Germany, France, Italy, uh, UK, and um, uh, and the US now joined by uh, by Lithuania, uh, which of course uh, once was a very big, important country with Poland, but uh, but those six have been you know doing providing s support uh, alongside with Poland s strongly day after day after day after day. I mean huge amounts of 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 military training is has been going on constantly um and uh, and after the the quint six met uh, i think about a week and a half ago uh, there there were quite a few um uh, quite a few equipment deliveries into uh into ukraine uh, and the you know the heavy aircraft came in and, and bought things so uh, th those were done re really that support was done really rather quietly. I mean, nobody jumped up and down and said, we're doing this, but it was done. And it was noticed by by people that the aircraft came and the aircraft brought things in. So I think that that, that will continue. That's not going to stop whatever happens. 
the intelligence side which was mentioned i mean the, the intelligence is going on if you actually go on uh, onto um uh, onto the sort of the aircraft site where you can track what aircraft you can see that the the, the drones us drones nato drones are flying constantly around and watching what's going on well they're not doing that for for fresh air that intelligence is obviously being given um to ukraine uh, as well as to other NATO countries. So th there's a lot, th there is a lot happening already. The, the, the big question, of course, with, with Ukraine is how much more does it want? Because there comes a point where you, you actually, if you actually want support, then the, the, the best support are those things that are, you can be helped with inside. Uh, and there are people that would come from, from NATO would send people to help more closely. But it's pretty pointless if you if, if you want support, but you're not willing to actually to give someone a, a pass so they can get into the Ministry of Defence and help you. Um, helping from the hotel is not really useful help. So there's two sides to this. What can NATO do? Well, NATO will do more if NATO is allowed to do more. But if NATO is kept on the sidelines and only helps uh, helps outside of the system, then then it's being it, 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 what support there is is actually being wasted, in my view, uh, uh, and and that again is a is a Ukraine problem. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, and uh, we also have this question uh, about uh, Hungary position. Uh, uh, we know that uh, this country uh, was blocking uh, uh, Ukraine NATO commission on the highest uh, level and um, maybe you have some updates uh, uh, how this situation is evolving uh, and uh, in this uh, current situation uh, can we expect uh, another blocking in the case of something uh, is happening around Ukraine. Okay, who, who, who can answer this question? Maybe Valery, you know the situation, not? Uh, as for Hungary, uh, I guess that it's uh, temporary unblocking <laughs> uh, because uh, it's not changing the total attitude and the, the drive of Hungary to use the, uh, this tool uh, in favor of its interests. Uh, but uh, as soon as we have the military threat now in the Eastern Europe, so it's a unique situation and it's a uh, the option uh, that uh, was forced to, to, to uh, organize at some kind of meeting that was yesterday in uh, Brussels. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, if uh, that situation will be normalized, that uh, it will be uh, the normal practice of, of such meetings. Um, if you don't mind, I would uh, just to add a few words uh, on previous topic. Um, of course, the better is deter. But if uh, we are talking about the worst scenarios, um, what we expect from NATO is uh, uh, we, what we don't expect, let's say. It's indifference, it's sanctions, especially uh, the sanctions which are actually now coming from European Union, uh, not so effective as, for example, the United States sanctions. Uh, and uh, the another high level of this top, uh, it's a kind of weak position, which uh, for sure will move the red lines of Russia, uh, and uh, they will go ahead with the aggression. And it's not even limited with Ukraine. Just uh, remember about the military training, the Zapad, in Belarus. So um, that's what they have to understand now, what kind of red lines NATO having and uh, how far Russia could go. And uh, um, what we need and what we expect is the high level of readiness to interfere, even militarily. Uh, and um, precisely, uh, Donald Cook destroying as of sea, it's very good response. Thank you. Thank you, Valery. Uh, other comments? 
No? Um, and uh, another question um, is concerning a uh, quite unique uh, uh, cooperation uh, between uh, Ukraine, Poland and Lithuania, so-called uh, Lublin uh, Triangle. Um, what uh, does this um, cooperation mean for Ukraine NATO cooperation? Uh, and uh, do you think that uh, this Lublin Triangle can be some uh, bridge yeah, to Ukraine's NATO membership? Okay, uh, maybe, maybe it's, it's a question first of all to our Polish and Lithuanian friends. <laughs> Well, clearly, we we are very much in, in favor of Ukraine being as close as possible to to the community of nations we belong to, uh, being both European Union and NATO. You know, for us, you know, Ukraine is not a, a, a question of sort of one of the issues, is the issue, is strategic situation. Uh, that's why we certainly will be very much involved in assisting Ukraine in every uh, way we can. Uh, we are very glad that we can count on, on, on support of other countries like, like, like Lithuania. Uh, but that won't be enough. Uh, the only problem we have now is specifically as far as European Union is concerned that our position in the European Union is, is relatively weak because of the of the problems we have with European Union. Uh, I, but I do not want to go into our sort of internal uh, squabbles and, and, and political uh, controversies. Uh, but nevertheless, I think that what really is important is that the, the Ukra Ukrainian issue is, is completely shared by every political party and political group in, 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 in Poland. Uh, so we hope that we can maintain our uh, support to Ukraine and we hope that it somehow some sooner or later will be will will bring the facts. Uh, thank you, Janusz Mantas. Uh, thank you. Well, the three countries have already been cooperating in the security sphere uh, with the formation of the Lithuanian Polish Ukrainian Brigade, uh, Lit Paul Ukr Brigade, in uh, so called in 2014 in the city of Lublin. The brigade uh, is meant uh, to fulfill tasks. Uh, uh, given to it by the EU, NATO, and the United Nations. But uh, I congratulate this uh, this initiative because I think it's the first uh, Central Europe-specific alliance that Ukraine has joined, as the country is currently not a part of the Visegrad Four or the Bucharest Nine. So um, this is, I think, another good step of Ukraine to Europe, a return into the European family of nations. So uh, more initiatives uh, which will work. Uh, more nearest uh, the future will come within NATO. So well, let me let me remind you that we also had Polish Ukrainian battalion, uh, which was not just sort of a, a formal uh, construct. Uh, it was actually used used in in, in Balkans. Uh, so uh, it, there is a certain tradition. And also, let me remind you that we have also Ukrainian presence uh, in, for example, uh, the core, uh, which has its headquarters in Szczecin, uh, which is a, a northeast core of NATO. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Other comments on this topic? Uh, not. Um, yeah, so another question is concerning new NATO strategic concept. We know that. Uh, uh, it will be adopted in, uh, uh, maybe it can be adopted this year, yes. And what do you personally expect? Uh, uh, it's, what uh, what uh, points uh, NATO needs to make uh, uh, for its members, for its partner countries, uh, yeah, to prove that uh, this organization is ready for new challenges and is ready for such challenges as Russian uh, military aggression? Uh, so, uh, who, who can answer this question? Yeah, Glenn? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually quite, um, I mean, I'm quite positive about NATO, but uh, and because having worked in it and actually seen it, I mean, it's, it's terrible in lots of ways. 
Um, but 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 there again, it, you know, when you actually do work with everybody else, you see you do see more sort of common uh, commonality uh, than 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 otherwise. But but the, the the trouble in some ways is that NATO is constrained by its name, um, by North Atlantic Alliance, when really it's a it's a it's a, an organisation of values, and that uh, that that it, it would have done it would have done well in some ways to have had another name that would allow it to bring in uh, to bring in Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, and maybe one or two others. Um, because because their va- the values uh, is the underpi- underpinning uh, underpinning uh, concept of, of, of NATO and, and and it's got you know th- this group that we've got this team that we've got has got to be able to face uh, the future of things that are outside of our immediate v- uh, vicinity because the countries have got to face those things. And if the countries in NATO have got to face those, like China, like possibility of, of, of things going wrong in other parts of the world, if we've all got to face those, then we've got to face them together. And if we've got to face them together, then it means it's NATO. Um, but, but, you know, it needs a bit of it needs a bit more thinking about in that terms. But so I hope that the future of NATO will actually will focus a bit more on 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 how we deal with these things in in a more coherent group with our the people who we share common values. Uh, thank you for your answer, Janusz. Well, I think that what really happened in NATO was that at the beginning. NATO had only one basic goal, that was common defense. But uh, since several years, NATO expanded uh, that, 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 that mission, uh, in, including also the problems of the NATO neighborhood, of, the, of creating somehow sort of, you know, friendly, friendly neighborhood and stable neighborhood. And I think that uh, at the beginning, uh, NATO was simply involved in in area of responsibility. Then some nun said that NATO should go out of area or will be out of business. Then with the re uh, with the emergence of, of the threats from Russia, NATO again was concentrating on on sort of problems of 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 of, of, of our region, but it looks like NATO will have to go again, also out of area, and that means that in NATO the feeling that the security of NATO should be actually uh, fought for not on borders of NATO countries, but outside involving countries which are important for stability of our region and for the security of our region, that will, that, that, that will be maintained. And Ukraine obviously will be sort of within this area of NATO, serious concern. Uh, okay, thank you. Other comments on this topic? Uh, of course, uh, we are expecting to take a response on uh, the issue uh, what is Russia now for NATO? So uh, clearly it's not a partner or some party which uh, is cooperating with the NATO as it was put in the Lisbon uh, summit concept in the 2010. Um, also, the issue of one voice. Um, Thirty member states. It's uh, it's a huge number of national interests. We need to um, uh, understand, and uh, we we need to, to speak about. So, uh, and um, concept is good, but the white paper, Glenn Grant, know is better. And the white paper is something very uh, clear uh, with uh, some kind of understanding what the, the, uh, these countries have to do in uh, the time when uh, the worst scenario will uh, follow by, by some country. So um, that's uh, the ultimate uh, challenge for, for NATO, to be very clear for its members, to be a good defense for its members. 
uh, and uh, of course the Russia trying to undermine this understanding. Uh, the same story as they did in Ukraine, uh, a splitting country of some, some kind of classes, first class, second class, third class, so and it's the same story in, in NATO, they're so trying to undermine that understanding and solidarity. So uh, the solidarity and uh, the new understanding of how to react is um, really important. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, another comments, no? Uh, Valery, unfortunately, you have another question, <laughs> yes. Uh, so it's about uh, Russian language uh, as a tool uh, yeah, uh, is it a problem? Uh, is, is it a matter of self-identification? Yeah, of Ukrainians, uh, and um, is really uh, this Russian language is a weapon? Yeah, as uh, some uh, critics uh, think. Um, as we know from our officials, there exists a Ukrainian-Russian language, so uh, <laughs> um, we couldn't deny it. <laughs> Uh, but uh, talking seriously, um, Russian language matters in, in Ukraine, and um, it's a hybrid weapon of Russia. Whereas the Russian-speaking population um, in Latvia, in Estonia, in Lithuania, in Ukraine, uh, that will be Russian passports. And afterwards, it will be a Russian interest on in the sovereign territory of the states. Um, what has happened with the so-called DPR, LPR, uh, the proxy states of Russia here and uh, the proxy regimes they as uh, they made. So um, we need also to change probably from two to three generations to overcome our uh, Russian language, uh, the dependence from Russian Russian language. We are uh, now doing a lot uh, about the uh, policy uh, moving forward the Ukrainian language in a, uh, any sphere of uh, life, but uh, talking honestly, especially in Kharkiv, especially in Odessa, in some Eastern region, uh, regions, uh, is it a successful story? I'm not sure. So it's a very painful um, process. Uh, and uh, do we have to waste the time? Do we have sacrifice uh, uh, with the um, efficiency of our messaging to, to the population living in the territory? Of course not. So we need just to make the message box for our own population about not only the NATO perspective or European perspective or foreign policy, which actually is not uh, so... Um, understandable by population, but uh, about the um, very clear nature of our state and what is Ukraine and uh, where we are going and uh, who we are actually. So uh, no matter what language it will be, Crimean Tatars language, English, the uh, Dutch or Ukrainian or Russian. So, but we have to do that uh, and uh, to speak honestly with our own population. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Valery. Um, there may be other comments. Uh, I pose the same question to Edward Lucas from SEPA, and he answered, yeah, that you can use Russian language as a hybrid web yeah, against Russia. So it's a discussion, we know, we know that it's now uh, uh, quite uh, popular in Ukraine and president of Ukraine and uh, the secretary of president of Ukraine, they uh, stated that there is uh, some, yes, as Valery said, uh, Ukrainian Russia. Uh, so quite interesting. Uh, okay, uh, so we're moving uh, to final phase, and maybe uh, you have uh, other comments, uh, yeah, about uh, about uh, topic of our seminar. Uh, maybe some final conclusions, uh, and um, I, I propose to give some uh, two three minutes uh, if you want uh, uh, to to sum up, uh, yeah, our seminar and uh, make uh, final points. So. Maybe we can start from Glenn uh, and uh, yeah, and we we'll enter this way. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, we, we've managed to get all the way through this seminar amazingly uh, without anybody mentioning NATO standards. 
So therefore, I have to mention it at the end, having written it down at the beginning. I mean, this this thing about NATO standards is is I'm I'm not going to say it's a complete nonsense because of course there are some standards that actually people should 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 reach, um, but they. But but the idea that somehow you, you know you've you've achieved one thousand seven hundred standards, uh, or uh, as one general said, we've done seven thousand NATO standards. Heaven knows what those are, um, is 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 a a complete nonsense. I mean the, the move forward to NATO, the move forward to actually to, to get closer to NATO, is not about is not about NATO standards. It really is about people, and attitudes. Uh, and until the, this 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 thing is understood, it's how you deal with people. It's how you deal with the people that come in. It's how you talk to them. How you how you actually uh, the relationship that you have with them is is the major part of this. And and, and I agree. I mean, I was being a bit flippant uh, as Yanis sort of Yanis sort of actually pointed out when saying it's not about Re- Russia, but but actually. You know, Russia's been there. It was there before, and it's going to be there afterwards. Uh, and other people had problems with Russia, admittedly not um, n- not fighting, um, and they got into NATO. Uh, this is Ukraine has got this battle, this battle with itself. Does it really want to join NATO? And if it really wants to join NATO, then it's got to engage in those activities that NATO sees as being important. And that's not about some technical standards for joining NATO, because I can promise you that an awful lot of countries out there can't meet many of those standards that that, that, that people seem to think are important. But what they do meet is the willingness to join in and that the human interaction is, is of a good standard. That's that's me. Thank you, folks. Thank you very much, uh, Glenn uh, and Janos. Maybe some final points, maybe your final thoughts. Well, what I would say is that the NATO membership uh, is obviously something which Ukraine should uh, strive for and will get it finally, but it will take time. Uh, There are problems at this moment, Uh, the problems resulting from the fact that the international situation is entirely different than when uh, there was a problem of uh, Estonia or Latvia or or, or, or Lithuania joining NATO. Uh, That's the problem. But nevertheless, I think that, first of all, you should get, as as Glenn already has said, uh, you know, make NATO sort of something which would be looked at with sympathy in understanding and then also try to show to other members of Europe of European Euro Atlantic community that, that you know NATO with Ukraine will be stronger NATO than without it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, month of uh, your final. Uh, would be very thought. I think that uh, the NATO member, well, Ukraine's membership in NATO depends on 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 the West and its will, and uh, probably goodwill. We remember the Baltic states becoming NATO members. There were a lot of accusations and and uh, and a lot of discussions. But finally, you know, after very hard work, Glenn Grant mentioned. Uh, the, the, the the final decision was made, and, and those countries became NATO members. And I think Ukraine will step forward and will do anything that can. Uh, but it's also very important that uh, the West uh, European countries would uh, uh, do a lot and uh, take this uh, step very seriously. That Ukraine is a part of the Western civilization, and it should be in this family of the Western countries. Thank you very much, and Valery. Um, I would finish probably with a black humor. Um, One of my very good friend from Lithuania, uh, once he was asked uh, what Lithuania need to to guarantee its um, sovereignty and independence. Uh, It was, by the way, at the time when Lithuania was already the member of NATO. Uh, He responds, 
the only one thing that we need uh, to U.S. soldiers on our soil. The better one is one dead. So uh, that's uh, about uh, what we need. And uh, but but actually, it's about the black humor, of course. Uh, talking seriously, uh, what we need now is to keep calm and um, to make our job to make our job with high quality, uh, and uh, it, that uh, job have to be visible, uh, visible inside the country and outside the country. Uh, we need to predict unpredictable, uh, and uh, of course we have to rule the dy dynamics of the events. Uh, and not to go with uh, some environment of uh, the interests of any kind of sort parties which influence in, in our choice. So, because NATO uh, is uh, our own choice and our own responsibility. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Valerius. Thank you uh, uh, to all speakers uh, yeah, for such fruitful discussion uh, that we had. And then I want to give uh, the floor to our organizer, uh, Natalia Zubar. I want to thank one more time from Natalia Naur Stiftung uh, and uh, Natalia Zubar. Uh, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Andre. Thank you for the moderation. Of course, uh, thank you, everyone, for such a meaningful discussion, which was uh, headed in our heat up, I, I guess. Uh, I would dream of seeing you all in Kharkiv in person someday, and we will be happy to uh, add even more to our um, discussions. And uh, I would invite you again to join us. Uh, I want to remind you that we have records of all our previous discussions, including the one previous about the uh, Russian and Ukrainian languages. We uh, already had it, and if you didn't see it, uh, we will be happy to share it with you, because uh, we like um, before uh, discussing these uh, topics, and uh, I hope that you will have some ideas uh, about the topic like us to cover in the future. I think that our next discussion will be uh, dedicated to the pandemic and to the political uh, dimension of the pandemic. Uh, and we will update and thank you again. Uh, it was a work with you as always. Bye.